break through with the general public was the Tosca when you stood in for Callas? Uh, I wouldn't say general public. If you're, if you're talking internationally, yes. Yes, I was. Yes. From that point of view, um, I was suddenly found to exist even by the Tanganyika Post and yeah. <laughs> newspapers like that. Mm. And then I started to be in much more demand abroad than I had been previously. Did you ever meet Cutter? Well, yes. Oh, of course I did. I've worked with her. I was Clotilde to her Norma oh. when Stignani came. I think they both sang together for the last time there. Oh. And also Flora to her Violetta and to oh. Yes, I have met and spoken to her. I expect you're probably sometimes compared, aren't you? Yes, and do people even say, good for heaven's sake, have you changed your name to Mari Collier because it sounds like Maria Carlos? I said, no, for heaven's sake, the name, the name I was, with which I was born. Born in Melbourne, father Australian, mother from Italy. And the result of the mixing of blood is an unusually vivid, generous, outgoing, dramatic, even tempestuous personality. The dramatic soprano of today arrives via enforced piano lessons school choir, Gilbert and Sullivan, and singing lessons taken to alleviate boredom because she broke her arm. She was a chemist's assistant, took more lessons, an audition, and finally a performance in Melbourne in 1952 of Cavalleria Rusticana. In the following season, I did the Consul of Minotti. That was the greatest one, because it, in it introduced me to modern music as such. And uh, with a very good director, I was able to learn a little bit about the rismo thing, mm. really being a person yourself mm. on the stage. Did you ever learn acting? No. As such? No. Opera singers never seem to. They just Funny, pick it, it up. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, the music tells you almost everything. Yes. Yeah. Whether to be static or whether yeah. to what sort of movement to make. But Magda Sorrell, you do play Magda. Mag oh, good heaven, 76 times, I think, all over Australia, including, of all places, Broken Hill, which is a mining zinc place. And I think they've got about three cows to every two people. And an enormous bonus for mining there. And I think the jobs in the Broken Hill Corporation are inherited you know, through the family. But the interesting thing about it was, we did a matinee of the console for the miners at 10 o'clock in the morning. Have you ever seen the console? Does he speak? Does he breathe? Have you ever spoken to him? My child is dead. His mother is dying. My own life is in danger. I ask you for help, and all you give me is papers. What is your name, Madam Forest? Age 23. Color of eyes, color of hair, single of marriage, British or race, labor of both, father's dead, mother's dead. I'm afraid that I need your help. What is your name? What is your name? 
What is your name? What is your name? This is my answer. My name is woman. Age still young. Color of hair gray. Color of eyes the color of tears. Occupation waiting. Describe yourself as a chronically nervous person? I would say I, I suffer from chronic nervous tension. You live on your nerves? Very much. I wouldn't say I was a nervous person as such. Mm. I think if you have any feeling, any perception, anything like that, you have to be uh, with a certain temperament. You do have this tension, this feeling. Mm. I wouldn't say tension, but ner nerve ends are very sensitive, so to speak. Mm. Then how long does it take you to unwind? I mean, can you go straight to bed after a performance? Or? No, you can ask any performer, or maybe any doctor. I think something chemically happens to one, particularly if you become very much emotionally involved in a performance. And whatever the release is, adrenaline, something like that takes place and until the system has either absorbed or got rid of it mm. not until then can you fall asleep it is a process of unwinding mm. not i don't think it's one of nerves i think it's a, it's a purely a, a chemical thing marie collier lives at cookham an hour's journey from london in a small house at the edge of the village on the verge of open fields here marie collier the operatic star becomes Mrs. Victor <laughs> Forberg, the wife of an Australian civil engineer and the mother of four kids. Christopher, how old are you? Seven. Seven. Yes. And how old are you? Four. Now, take your hand away. How old are you? Four. Four. <laughs> and Barbara, how old are you? Nine. Nine. And Michael? Eleven and a half. Eleven and a half. And how old is he, this old dog? Oh, sixteen or seventeen. 16 or 70, that's about 120 to me. <laughs> what are you going to do? Are you going to sing or are you going to play the piano? What do you want to be? Well, I hope to sing, I think. You want to be a singer? Yes. I have to keep up with the children, you know. And uh, the latest craze is the monkeys. And uh, I have to tolerate the monkeys at the moment. I don't like them so much. I like them to watch them visually because I think they're quite clever. But to listen to them is eternal sort of beat is just a little bit too much. But I like um, pop music. I like uh, Italian music. I like, I like all sorts of things, really. You haven't been invited to do cabaret yet? No. You will be, I'm sure. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> I wonder how I'd react to that. But you adore clothes, don't you? I, I, I'm fascinated with clothes. I... Uh, 
uh, clothes to do with moods, to do with things, not just to put on any old thing. Mm. You have to feel like wearing something before you wear it. Um, I'd like to be very rich, but I'm not interested in money, which may sound contradictory. Mm. I'd like to be rich enough to satisfy my own demands and the demands of my family to the best of my ability. But I'm, I'm afraid I'm in the wrong profession. Maybe the cabaret will be the answer to that. <laughs> between Cookham and London is my transition from uh, home life to the life of an artist and vice versa. Mm. But then you've also made transition from being, so to speak, a London star to being a world star. Now and that's that... terrible. I find it's the worst transition of all. It, uh, it's a very, very lonely the pressure is tremendous. People expect an enormous amount of you. Um, the world is very, of such is very cutthroat. It's not like the family life of Covent Garden, mm. which was always so wonderful. But you arrive, you may not have met the singers before. It takes a while, your fellow singers, it takes a while for you to get to know them and even as artists even then when the rehearsals are finished you leave the theatre nothing well what do you do in, in a strange town picture galleries shops nothing nothing i always have a feeling of wanting to stay inside wherever i am maybe this is a psychological thing to at least make myself feel i belong in one place I go out very, very little, only when it's absolutely necessary. Mm. Colin Davis once said to me that he, he thought it was very funny, the success business. He said, you go on being exactly the same person and you go you on do. doing your job, but everything around you seems to change. Yes. People change, their attitude towards you changes. Mm. Now, there's a sort of an alienation in some sort of way, as far as success is concerned, in one aspect. What do you mean, alienation? An alienation. People don't think you're the same anymore. I see. Yeah. And uh, the other t other times, people don't treat you as a human being, but as a superhuman being, yeah. in lionizing you in a sort of way. But a little of that's probably rather nice, isn't it? Very little. <coughs> Very little indeed. Mm. 1967 is a milestone in Marie Collier's life because during this year she made her New York debut at the Metropolitan Opera. Would you please take me to the Russian tea room? Okay, lady. Not only was it my debut in one of the leading opera houses in the world, but it was also a world premiere. 
a work that was highly complex. So what little could I know of New York as such? Even when one is in a cab, you're not entirely free from the exact work you're doing. I always carry my score with me, particularly in this new work. And even after the opening night, always were present the librettist, the producer, and the composer. And I had come to a rehearsal one day knowing that certain cuts were being made. I'm marking the cuts because unfortunately I didn't have the score with me. And as I had later to meet Kakoyanis and uh, Levy over luncheon, I felt I should have my score with me in case we needed to refer to it. I must admit they were always very, very considerate. If an artist had a specific reason for wishing one part to be included, we never ever thought of exclusion. From them, what do you this and this is the one That's of the most heartrending yeah. and awful things. But I mean, could you find I mean walking about the streets you can you, Yes, you I can people, yes, you, I can, can meet people, I can talk to people. But also I find that people go to a new opera and what? their ears are completely kind of uh, virgin to the music that they hear and they, 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 they it's react. It's interesting, but I think it's very difficult for, for the, the public to absorb, it is to register the impact of any new score. Well, this first is, time, it even applies to, to, li once. to little popular songs, you know, the first time, any hit. The they don't know what they like about it, it on. but it catches. But it doesn't catch the first time they hear it. No, it is, but there's uh, something about it that they song. like, yeah. and they want to hear it yeah. again. Or even if or they don't, the second time they hear it, they say, oh, I'm glad I heard it again. They get to it. But I've it's heard so many opinions about, mm. not opinions, but so much controversy about what Schoenberg, Schoenberg wrote about your, reviewed your, about your music. Yeah, well, I cannot tell you people, it, it doesn't matter, but that is one individual opinion. Mm. But uh, this does not echo the whole public opinion. The piece was a new opera by an American composer called Marvin David Levy. The setting of O'Neill's play, Morning Becomes Electra. It was conducted by Zubin Mehta and produced by Kakoyanis. The opera itself seems to have been what they call a flop d'esteem, but he gave Mari Collier just the sort of dramatic role she can do so well, and she wowed the New York public. Run, Adam, run. do that anyway to get there because you're gonna have yes. to take this in one breath up to death yes and you want to hold it anyway there's right there at this rehearsal we are joining together the pieces that have been cut for example there was one phrase that said run adam run our hands are joined in ezra's death and not for your ships, nor your sea, nor your naked island girls. Will you dare leave me now? They decided to concertina this particular section. And he says, um... No, that's in. That's in. But it's the time between the time I go through the door and the time they, they go out of the door of the house. Mm -hmm. That's important no, for me, yeah. the length of time, how much I can do this. Yeah, there are only change. six or eight measures cut there. This is all okay. Can I do this? Because I'm not quite sure about. Mm. But here, I would keep it more or okay. less in tempo. No? Mm -hmm. I learn, I think, harmonically rather than melodically. You know, relative positions, the note in the basic chord, the chord underneath, and I mean the harmony can change from one note to another, so to speak. They don't follow a melodic line. The boss at the Met in New York is Rudolf Bing, and he seems to have been pleased with his Covent Garden import. To begin with, Miss Collier had a very great success, uh, which we were delighted with, and a deserved one. 
she brought a very special nervous tension to this part, uh, which made it gripping and exciting, in addition, of course, to an excellent voice. Uh, she was awfully pleasant in, in addition, which doesn't apply to all artists. Uh, she worked very hard. Was there any criticism of using a, an Australian artist in an American production of an American opera? Not at all. I, I, I don't think anybody knows that she's Australian. Uh, I didn't. We, we, we look for voices and not for nationalities and for artists, and that she is indeed. I think there is a very special artistic quality to her, wherever it may come from. 1967 was a milestone for the village of Cookham, too, for it gave birth to an arts festival. Naturally, the paintings of Stanley Spencer were featured, and just as naturally, Marie Collier was invited to be president of the festival. There is so much music in certain operas that are never done, that people hardly ever hear. Particularly, something I love, if I have an opportunity to sing with an orchestra in a concert, I like to do the Annunciation, Brevice Cecilia. At the very beginning it says, for the love of Jesus, hear everybody listen to this story. See the story of Cecilia, how pure she was, how she died in martyrdom. It's like an introduction, and originally it was meant for a statue or a person to stand in a certain position as a mosaic of uh, Cecilia in her own basilica in Rome. And uh, according to Refugee, the hands are slightly open and the eyes raised to heaven. I think uh, Claudio Muzio was the first interpreter of the Rome.
What about the differences in making opera in London and making opera abroad? Depends what you mean by making opera, what sort of opera, where, and under what specific conditions. When I mean, in the old days, I'm told it was possible to, to land off a plane and go to an opera house, and you knew that if you were Isolde, that you would enter right, and you would go off left, and then you'd have to come up stage a bit later, and so on, you know. That has still happens in the case of emergency. Yes. When somebody comes into a, a repertory role, they virtually do their own performance, but they're steered around the stage. Uh, for example, I did my, I did two musettas at uh, the Metropolitan. The first one, I met the baritone just before we went on stage. I had never been on stage, and I'd, I'd been through the score only once with the maestro. Now that is an international house. Uh, the expression amongst people now is that opera, unless it's something new, some specific production, is instant opera. <laughs> you just pour hot water on it. Yes, right? instant, and, and the, you, you mix a, a few ingredients together, and there it is. But like that must instant. be terrifying. It is terrifying, but this is the international thing. Uh, the more you travel internationally, in the bigger houses, the same colleagues you meet everywhere. This, they do virtually their own performances, unless you've got a very strong director. Mm. Uh, this is a thing I loathe and hate, because I think one should have more respect for opera than to do this instant opera business. But you see, people are expensive. Orchestras are expensive. Union business, all this. Mm. I suppose this is the reason why one will kill the other eventually. But at Covent Garden, they make it better? They do make it better depending on the work, because they normally work with their, their own team. Mm -hmm. If it's a repertory opera, I suppose it gets thrown on with one rehearsal. If it's a new you opera... You might have a, a one stage rehearsal, or two stage rehearsals, yes. In, at my, when I was singing a lot there. But that is when it is a, a role that you've already done before, and with people with whom you've already worked before. If it's a poem, for example, the Mimi and uh, the Rodolfo are imported, perhaps, they'll only come so many days beforehand. Somebody told me the other day you'd done your last Musetta. Is that really true? Yes. What does that mean, that you've sort of moved on to, uh, into a higher league? No, no. Um, as I've got a, a very considerable repertoire, I decided I had to limit certain things, and I had to decide my own reasons for limiting my repertoire. Mm. And uh, with a bit of self-examination, I decided that one of them would be Musetta. Mm. And not that I don't have success with Musetta, I do, but there's something about it that, to me, is not satisfying. You start at an enormously high peak. You must be zoom, really, there when it happens, when you enter. Mm. And then it just goes... In the fourth act, you become a second string. Yes, but uh, you don't... Second strings can be interesting.
myself a performer. Some people call themselves singing actresses, but I call myself a performer. Yes, well, and I hope that uh, it possibly means the same thing. But people say singing actress. They're two things almost, two separate parts. But for me, a performer as the integration of the two pieces. But I, I always found that you, you seem to me to be happier and more successful even in, in a piece that is very dramatic rather than a piece that is, contains is abstract singing. Uh, uh, yes, very much so, because it has a great a deal to do with my own self. Um, because in these highly dramatic pieces, I find a great deal of outlet for my own temperament. Her temperament, looks, voice, and the gift of getting really under the skin of the part she plays have brought Marie Collier to the top of her profession. She can now go where she likes, sing what she wants. And unlike so many female artists, she hasn't sacrificed the chance of having a family. The divided life must bring problems for her and her family, but they all seem to be surviving remarkably well. And in Mari's case especially, the one kind of life seems to stimulate the other, the public, the private.